All right, Megan's World. We actually have a guest. Yes, 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 we have a guest. And no, it's not the Trump supporter. Okay? I don't retire Trump supporter, Megan's World. All right? Now, I know many of you have heard about the new biography called Megan Misunderstood. I know. I know. I know. I know. Another biography about Meghan Markle by one of those royal gossipers. I know, I know what you guys are thinking. You guys are thinking, oh, hell no. Well, Meghan's world, on this episode, we actually have the Arthur of Meghan Misunderstood. Yes, yes, we do. Best-selling author of celebrity biographies, Mr. Sean Smith, who is here in the house to talk about his book in regards to the woman that we all love and appreciate. This is Megan Markle. Hello, Sean. Welcome to Megan's World News Channel. Welcome. Hi, Kyra. It's great to be here. Well, I am so happy that you accepted the invitation here on Megan's World News Channel to talk about your book, Megan Misunderstood. Now, Sean, were you aware of who Megan Markle was before she married into the royal family? No, I didn't have a clue. I hadn't watched uh, Suits, and I really didn't take much interest, even when she was revealed to be the love of, uh, of Prince Harry. It was only literally um, towards the end of last year, I was watching the television documentary about the couple in Africa. And the host uh, interviewed her, Tom Bradbury, very good uh, interviewer. And it was clear she was very upset. And I hadn't taken much notice, but I thought, what's all this about what's going on why is this woman so upset with what is going on in her life so i decided to try and find out and to find out about her and uh i was quite shocked to be perfectly honest okay so is that what you inspired is that what inspired you to write the book based on based on absolutely that yeah absolutely it was that very one thing i thought what does it come to when um a member of the royal family like this is so upset what she's been going through. And then I, I always like to start my books. In fact, the main emphasis of my books is always on the early life because of that's how dream, that's when dreams are formed. That's how personalities develop. So I always like to go back to the beginning. So I went to Los Angeles just before the uh, lockdown, thank goodness. <laughs> and uh, was able to plot my way around, but I always like to see the areas that I'm talking about. So I went to Woodland Hills and walked up and down the, the streets where, where she was born. I went to um, Cloverdale uh, Drive, where she lived with her mum, and I had a wander around just to get a feel for that part of LA. I went to where she lived um, with her dad. And, 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 you know, knocked on a few doors and, and just to get a sense of who lived there, where it was, because obviously I'm an Englishman abroad and I wanted to find out, you know, I've been to uh, LA for books um, quite a few times, mm -hmm. but everyone is different and this was different for me. So I wanted to sense, I went to the Immaculate Heart School and they were brilliant there uh, to me, I have to say and uh, a big shout out to them for being so um, kind and welcoming. Um, what I loved about your book was the way you chronicled Megan's life before she met Prince Harry. Um, you actually interviewed people that knew her, that had relationships with her, that had interactions with her, either it was during her childhood, through middle school, high school. Um, you know, you didn't use sources. You actually interviewed real people. So 
tell me how was that when you when you approach these people to, to talk about making for your book well some people are reluctant to speak to you because they've been burned by um the media coverage and by uh, how they've been represented and how other people that they know have been represented and, and that's always something I, I i face with all my books actually that the worst thing that's ever happens to me is if the the media have been to town first because then nobody trusts you and you it's an uphill struggle to say hey look you know it's it's not going to be like that oh yeah yes <laughs> there, there you go and you you have to try and win over people's confidence but um, with all my books, and this is especially true of Megan, uh, my strategy is always this. I want the reader to like the person more at the end of the book than they do or might do at the beginning. So you can be, um, you can show light and shade someone's life because that makes them interesting doesn't it yes. you know if it was it's not a fanzine um a, a book isn't like that you have to engage the reader and uh, as you say chronicle what happened in their lives mm -hmm. and what i found very interesting with megan was that um she'd always had a voice even as a as a young girl i, I mean we all know the, the one or two of the very well known stories about the Procter and Gamble ad when 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 she was 12 and how she was on TV saying that you had to speak up for yourself whatever age you were and and, and when she gave that speech at, at, at middle school in which she she referenced uh, the fight against uh, AIDS and HIV I mean she's a, a, a young teenager right so you know these these important issues and one of the things I feel very strongly about is that um, Megan is, is unfairly criticized because of the negative backlash against being what is perceived as woke. That is a word I absolutely hate um, because it is used as uh, some sort of blunt instrument to, to, to beat you with, you know, oh, you're just woke. But in fact, all you're doing is um, representing and putting forward ideas that matter in the world today right. particularly to to young people and uh you know the uh the, the, the older generation uh, are still you know in the past somewhere and, and hate to be told about um you know things that actually really matter and gradually countries are waking up to to climate change and that sort of thing but boy has um Poor uh, old, well, poor young Greta Thunberg had a had a really rough time getting her point across, and she just—it's not rocket science. She's saying things that we all should embrace. She did. She absolutely did. Um, how did Megan's parents influence her to become the woman that she is today? Because while reading your book, um, what I noticed was that. Her father seemed to influence more of her artistic side, and her mother seemed to influence more of her, you know, charity side, more of her um, giving back to others and, and, and uh, women empowerment side. So, so how, what's your point of view on that in regards to her parents' influence? I think you put that quite well. I think um, it's easy to underestimate um the influence that her dad had on her as a child um i think it was a very um, positive influence um obviously today uh, with the media coverage um which we know about don't we um there is a, a huge aura of negativity surrounding their relationship uh, that wasn't always the case and he you know stuck up for things uh, as well that that, that mattered her mum uh, was always um, had a social conscience. That's a good way of putting it, I think. Right, that's a better word. Yeah, yeah. She she took uh, she took Megan. She was working um, in the travel industry at, at one time, and she took Megan to Mexico, for instance, um, where uh, they saw some of the uh, slum areas, and 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 
children hustling for for money on the streets and that sort of thing and this is only a a, a child uh, but it had an effect on on megan at that age and uh, her mum would uh, encourage her to join uh, the local church that they went to where there, there was a sense of community there was a sense of volunteering right. um, it's uh, I went to actually to the, uh, the hippie kitchen, as it's called, in LA, where um, she volunteered. She didn't get on very well when she was too young, really, at 13 or 14. But when she went back there a couple of years later at high school, she embraced it and, and, and realized the importance of what she was, she was doing. In fact, that sort of volunteering, it's one of the things I, I like about Megan's story, is that things that matter to her as a child, she hasn't just put them to one side, right. it still matters. So when she was in Toronto, she volunteered at a, at a kitchen. And when she was in um, the UK, she um, embraced the hub community uh, cookbook, which was uh, from the uh, London disaster, the Grenfell Tower disaster, and how many families were displaced and they needed meals cooked for them, and that sort of thing, and raised right. funds. And when she went to LA, um, she and Harry were um, off uh, volunteering, delivering meals, weren't they? I, I'm right. sure you saw, the, oh. saw those pictures. So, you know, she is not a, a, a whimsical jump on one bang wagon. And then I'll jump on something else because this one's more fashionable. She's stuck with that sort of volunteering for, you know, more than 20 years. Right, she did. Because she isn't, you know, one of the things that I've often said um, uh, about her is that she was treated as if she was a starlet, but she was a mature woman in her mid and now late 30s. She's going to be 40 next year. Exactly. She is not a child. Exactly. And you really detailed that for like 10 years or more, you know, Megan was this unknown actress in Hollywood and she took a lot of small roles and on random TV shows, but she finally got her big break on Suits. But um, what I got from your book was that when she got this big break on Suits, that her celebrity profile, of course, you know, increased and she was having all this success in Hollywood. However, it appeared that her, um, she became even more involved in charity work and, um, and, and participating in causes of social injustice. And, and um, she took that to the world stage. Um, and was doing a lot more speaking engagements and, and really uh, got herself into a position to where she was developing relationships with world leaders and even speaking in front of world leaders. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit in regards to- Absolute, Absolutely. Yeah. You're completely right, of course, because uh, a struggling actress as she was during her 20s in LA, where I think the phrase I use in the book is, uh, you have very little to say and you wear even less. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's true. So she didn't have a voice, but as she, celebrities have a voice. And one of the things that I always, uh, point of view that I always uh, try and, and try and make is that we shouldn't have a downer on celebrities speaking out about things that matter because people listen to them. They have fans. They have people who are interested in what they have to say. Uh -huh. so, so if they are going to highlight, for instance, as Megan did, um, the need for fresh water in Rwanda, that's a good thing because she has the voice to be able to do that. As, as a, a, a struggling actress in her 20s, she didn't have that voice. But when she had it, with suits, she used it. And that's one of the things that I particularly liked. When Megan met Prince Harry, when Prince Harry and Megan met, right, what do you think intrigued Prince Harry about Megan Markle? Well, 
I, I won't deny that Meghan Markle is very beautiful, is she not? So I would be, anybody would be intrigued to start with. Um, I think we can accept that and that's fair. We can move on from that. She is very beautiful, but she is also um, articulate, she's intelligent, and she cares about things that Harry actually cares about. And this was something which I'm sure he was thrilled to discover that um, here, here was a woman who had, she'd actually been to Afghanistan. He'd done two tours there. She went there on, on one of those um, celebrity cheer up the troops tours, but she still had to do it. You know, you still have to go and do it. You have to be there and wish, you know, the guys on the ground there, happy Christmas or happy holiday. Mm -hmm. and, and she actually did this and she'd actually been to Africa and to refugee camps, uh, something which um, Harry himself um, is very in tune with, uh, especially through the work that his late mother did right. uh, in, in, in Africa, which he you know, was hugely affected by and, and still is. So um, it's hardly a surprise that one of well, the last royal tour they did really was to South Africa, uh, in which she gave, for me, well, the, the, the best royal speech of, of recent years, which she gave to the women in the, in the township at Cape Town. Um, I'll paraphrase it, but I'm sure you know it. Um, right, right. You know, I, I stand uh, before you as a, a woman, as a woman of color, and as your sister, I stand with you and I stand for you. Right. And I just thought it was a great speech. It really was. I saw that that speech. I thought that whole um, South African trip that that I saw on ABC here in America um, really highlighted how she had the the charisma and and um, the connectivity to the people in South Africa. Um, you know, she de I think her global ambassador skills worked very well, not only during that tour, but also the Australian tour and when they were in Fiji as well. And Absolutely. It, it's empathy, isn't it? It's, it's, I, I, I call it a, at various stages, the, the Megan hug. And, and, you know, <laughs> there are some people that you, you, you instinctively feel like, well, yes, I want to hug with you, as it were. And there are some that you don't. And she has that, as you called it, connectivity. And that's also very good. And I, I particularly liked when um, she were, went to the school um, in London on the, her very last um, solo visit. Right. And she was, uh, I mean, she hugged the head boy and that was great. Um, I'm sure for him as well. And um, but the point she was making, which was uh, a very serious one, um, it was to promote, um, was it Women's Day? I can't remember exactly what title it was, but she wanted to involve the boys in showing them how important it was in their lives that the girls were. Um, and what they also could achieve. It wasn't, and it goes right back, doesn't it, to um, her getting that ad changed for Procter & Gamble when she was 12, because mm -hmm. why are the women in the kitchen? Everybody should be in the kitchen and everybody should be out, you know, making something of themselves. Everybody should have the opportunity to be properly educated. Right. And, and you know, these are just uh, things that are, are obvious when you say them, but if nobody is saying them, people forget about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, like we were talking about earlier, um, you always hear, you know, the British critics, and I'm not just going to say British, but critics, period, um, say that, you know, that they welcome Megan with open arms and, um, you know, they, they, they accepted Megan in the beginning and um, all of this negativity and, the reason why people don't like her is because she brought it on herself. Uh, what I loved about your book was how you brilliantly, you know, chronicled how um, that really wasn't the case at all. And um, that the, really the dehumanizing and the vilifying and the crucifying of Megan started uh, with the British press as soon as they found out that uh, Megan and Prince Harry were dating. Um, I want you to tell us about uh, some of the articles that the British press was already um, 
writing about Megan, you know, as soon as the news broke out that she was dating, dating I'm sorry, Prince Harry. Well, absolutely. Within uh, a week, I, I describe in the book as a week in hell. Uh, basically, the, the first story said that he was dating a, an actress and an activist, I think. And then that was the nicest thing that was practically ever written about. <laughs> you know, she, she went from being a, an activist to, to being Harry's girl very quickly. She was a saucy divorcee, a very well columnist over here said, whatever you do, Harry, don't put a ring on her finger. Um, and oh, another one said, uh, as the, as the uh, daughter, as a Roman Catholic and the daughter of a, a, a white, I can't remember what occupation they said, and a, uh, a black mother, she isn't out of central casting as a royal princess. Um, another went on about how um, she would bring, uh, she would thicken the blood, wasn't she? she was an exotic, right. uh, I think we, we all know that one, right. how uh, her mum was a dreadlocked woman from the wrong side of the tracks, how um, there was another headline that said Harry's uh, girl on Pornhub, uh, which was uh, a ridiculous uh, story on the front page of one of the tabloid newspapers. And I liked uh, the response of, of one of the uh, American uh, colonists to that, who said um, it was sort of seen from suits that even your, you know, most prudish grandmother wouldn't consider <laughs> pornographic. You know, it was just like a, a bit of nothingness, really, in, the, in, the, in from a top rated show. So it was all a bit ridiculous to be perfectly honest and, and she was as i said harry harry's girl and harry's hottie as if as if she was a uh, an 18 and 19 year old not a 35 year old self-made millionaire the first millionaire they'd ever had uh, come into the uh, royal family exactly and, and it was a it was a disgrace quite honestly and i i hadn't really until i started to look at it closely and itemize it as, as you pointed out i did uh i hadn't realized what had gone on because you know if you read one paper a day or half a paper a day or something on you know you don't get a feel of just how relentless and all embracing it was that's one of the interesting things mm -hmm. Uh, at the um, in the introduction to the book, I, I wonder whether um, she uh, was treated as an other because uh, of her ethnicity, because of her gender, because of her nationality, or because of her profession. A black American female actress, wow. and I discovered basically that it was all of these things mm -hmm. um extraordinarily uh she couldn't win on any level right and i think that that's why what i perceive and many of her fans perceive is one of the reasons why the hate smear campaign continues to this day you know because they are no longer working royals but it seems like the negativity and um, the consistent reporting on them both now is always spun in a very negative way when it comes to the British press. And that's why I'm so happy that they're here in America, because what I've noticed is, is that here in America, when Harry and Meghan are reported on, it's in more of an objective view. There's no spin. There's really no opinion to it. They just report it, and it seems like that narrative, the American narrative, is way more global than the British narrative, and um, that's why I'm so happy that they're here. Um, what is your opinion about that? Are you saying that? Well, I'm very pleased to hear you say that. Negativity is easier than positivity. It sells more newspapers, it gets more click on, clicks online, it gets more online reaction. They all come out of the woodwork for a negative story. Mm. And um, so that's one thing to say straight away. They are an easy target mm. and they remain so. Mm. Um, and uh, 
the narrative is spun from almost from story to story, depending on what is perceived to be the best way to proceed to get most publicity for that particular story. So, for instance, um, there was the there was the story that Harry uh, wanted a um, wreath laid at the cenotaph, and that was um, which is the war memorial in London on Remembrance Sunday uh, in November, and that was refused because uh, he was no longer a working royal, and then opposite to that, conversely when Meghan urged everyone to get out and uh, vote in your recent election, uh, she was strongly criticised because you're not meant to do that as a member of the royal family. Well, make your mind up. Are they members of the royal family or not? You know, are, they are clearly not working members of the royal family. As far as I am concerned, personally, she can say what she likes. Right. She is an American woman, now uh, back in America, it's her home. That was, wasn't that one of the first things she said when she returned over there? It's good to be home, she said. Yeah, that's exactly that's, and, and Absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, she can be as political as she likes. Good. You know, as long as she's saying things that are clearly the right thing to say. Everybody should get out and vote. For goodness sake, it, it, it took long enough for everybody to have the vote. So at least, <laughs> you know, seriously, didn't it? So at least go and uh, exercise your right, for goodness sake. What do you think um, Prince Charles and William thought about Meghan when they first met her? That I don't know, to be perfectly Yeah, I honest. know you don't have insight into that. No, I don't. And, um, you know, there, there are, um, you know, there have been, been stories, obviously, everybody's read them about the fallout between William and Harry. Mm -hmm. I, the, the only thing I would like to say about that mm -hmm. is I don't think we know the whole story. Okay. Why, you know, you're, you're from the UK. Why do you think um, it was hard for the royal family to embrace Meghan? And I'm not going to, not necessarily the royal family, but more so the people that they work with. I, I'm, I more so think it was the different houses, the royal staff and the royal reporters and, and people like that. The men in gray suits, Diana used to call them. Right. It's the, why do you think they had such a hard time embracing her or they just didn't want to embrace her? Where did that come from? Well, she wasn't uh, somebody who um, could be shaped and fashioned into the royal wives that they have already, who, you know, are influenced by tradition and protocol. And as we, as we said, um, you know, Meghan Markle was already a, uh, a 35 year old uh, woman who was um, out in the world. Mm -hmm. She, she wasn't going to be, you know, and, and, and she brought her, uh, her own work ethic and uh, way of, of dealing with things into a, a state and uh, environment that didn't want to change. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Um, but when I look at it from afar, it just seemed like to me that Megan was representing the royal family um, in a very good way. I thought she was a very good ambassador. Oh, clearly. Family. Clearly. She bought, you know, she bought minions in with her. There were so many people across the world from different ethnic backgrounds, different races, um, who were paying attention to the royal family at all. And once she married into the royal family, people really started to pay attention to them again. And what I loved about her was that she was bringing attention to different communities that you didn't really see the royal family interact with. And I just don't understand why they did not see that as a positive and why they just didn't protect her more. I completely agree with you. I think it was a 
totally lost opportunity. I mean, just as we were speaking uh, earlier about uh, the school that she went to, what other member of the royal family could go to that school and interact so well with uh, the boys and girls there? I, I, I can't see that anybody else could. It would have all been rather stuffy. Um, and as we also said, she brought charisma to the party. Mm -hmm. That, you know, so when she got on, on the flight across the Atlantic, the empathy and the charisma left with her. Um, you know, I don't want to come across as, you know, a, a, um, a big, in inverted commas, fan of Meghan Markle, because I, from my point of view, that doesn't do her justice. Right. What I can do is I can look at her life and present it in the right way for people to make their own judgment about her, right. which you have done. And uh, I'm very pleased that, that you see it as I think it is pretty obvious to see. <laughs> and and you know, so I've tried to explain her life and, and uh, follow the narrative of her life in, a, in an accurate and fair way. Well, in your book, I thought you did an excellent job in doing that. I mean, to me, you presented um, facts and um, and I thought you did a very, a very good job in chronicling her life. Um, I just wanted to ask you one more question. What do you think happened with her father? Um, I know a lot of people in the success squad are gonna get upset with me for saying this, but he did appear to be a very good father to her. Uh, while she was growing up, uh, what happened? How how did he, what appears to us, just turn on his own child and sell her down the river? What? And you may not know, but like, why why would he do? Why does he realize that he's really hurting his own child? And for what? It's a very interesting uh, question, actually, and I don't, don't mind chatting about it at all, because um, somebody else, uh, um, oh, I, I won't bother you with who it was, was interviewing me and um, put it round the other way and said, how could a daughter treat her father like that? And you just put it to me, how could a, a father treat his daughter like that? So, you know, there are two sides of looking at it, but what I would say is that um, somebody who I interviewed who uh, knew him well back in the day and liked him very much, and people did, they, he was he was well liked, um, said he isn't a, a, a person who thrives in front of the camera. He is a person who thrives behind the camera. In other words, having the spotlight on him and, and, and the glare of, of publicity is not something that he would handle well or easily. This is just what they told me. It does seem to me that he has um, been manipulated by um, outside sources. And I think that is pretty obvious. I just wish um, everyone would leave him alone and see if uh, there could possibly be some sort of reconciliation in the future. I'm sure it'd be very, you know, I don't want to sound a big old softy here, but it would be, it would be, it would be nice if he had some involvement in his grandson's life, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, sex and squad, don't get mad at me. I just, I had to ask the question. Um, <laughs> don't get mad at me. <laughs> Do you think Harry and Meghan will ever rejoin uh, the royal family as working royals? Um, as of my opinion today, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I would be amazed. I think already they are showing that they can be a global couple. I mean, I, it could be a party game, couldn't it? Name the 10 most famous couples in the world. And number one would probably be Barack and Michelle, wouldn't it? And, and then two might be Jay-Z and Beyonce. But somewhere down this list, I, I, I strongly think would be Harry and Meghan. Everybody knows who Harry and Meghan are. So now when they, they speak about uh, things that are important in the world, and I'm sure that they, you know, when we 
hopefully come through uh, the worst of the pandemic, they, they can get out and about a bit more right. um, in the world. Um, I think that's a, a great role for them. Already, it seems to me that they are uh, global in a way that the, uh, in the UK, you're not. What do you think is next for Harry Lane? I I would love to see um, Meghan become more politically active. Oh, um, you would. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think it would be you know because she really gives great speech, doesn't she? She she is she absolutely does, and she is articulate and can put forward uh, views about things that matter. And uh, I really like that about her. And um, I don't know, I'm not suggesting uh, like tomorrow she's going to be the next Michelle Obama or Kamala Harris. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous mm -hmm. to suggest that. But I, I see no reason. I, in the book, I have tried to present Meghan Markle as I see her as a woman of substance. So whatever she decides to do in the future, I would like to see her grow as a woman of substance. She already is one, but one can always become more substantial. You know, I'm going to end it right there. You're absolutely right. You articulated that very well. She definitely is a woman of substance. She was a woman of substance before she met Prince Harry, and she will continue to be a woman of substance. Um, She's a duchess of impact, is what we like to call her. But at the end of the day, she is a woman of substance and a woman of impact. Mr. Sean Smith, best-selling celebrity author, the author of Megan Misunderstood. I want to thank you for coming on Megan's World News Channel, presenting your book. And um, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. We really do. It's been a great pleasure. All right, we would like to thank best-selling, award-winning author, Mr. Sean Smith, for coming on Megan's World to discuss his book, Megan, Misunderstood. Now, I, Special K, as I stated in the interview, I read the book. I read the book, okay? And it only took me four days to read the book. So that should tell you something right there. But anyway, I, Special K, I endorse the book. I have to admit, I was against the book. I was real skeptical because I never heard of Sean Smith in my entire natural life. I thought he was some royal reporter, some royal rodent. But he's not, guys. He's not. Okay? He has a documented history of writing award-winning, well-researched biographies about famous people. And when it comes to Megan Misunderstood, that's exactly what he did. He hit the ground running. He interviewed people, credible people that actually knew Megan Markle. And he presented a totally different narrative than you read and hear from those rural rodent. Oh, you know what? Don't even get me started. Okay. Yes. I special K. I endorse the book. If you're a Megan fan, Stan, and you love reading books, I suggest you get Megan misunderstood. You know what? It would make an awesome Christmas present, too, for somebody who loves Megan Markle. All right? All right. Moving on. All right. Here we go with a famous Megan Markle quote. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it. And people need to be encouraged. Oh my God, what? What the hell is going on? What? Oh, Megan's World, I am so sorry. Hold, hold, hold on. Y'all cheated. Y'all Oh my God, it's Trump support. Y'all cheated. Y'all cheated. Oh my God. Hold, hold on, Megan's world. Hold on, hold on. Trump supporter, get out of here. Get, get out. 
Y'all trade it. Yeah, l- listen to me, Spencer Clark. Y'all trade it. Trump 2020. Y'all trade it. Get, get out. Get out. Oh, my God. <laughs> I am so sorry, Megan's world. I, what the hell is wrong with these Trump supporters? Jesus. All right. Now, we're going to go back. (laughs) I need a drink. (sighs) We're going to go back. And I'm going to try to say this Meghan Markle famous quote. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it. And people need to be encouraged to listen. I like that quote. I do. I really do. And I will say it one more time. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it. And people need to be encouraged to listen. Megan Markle. All right, guys. I'm Special K Thoughts, a.k.a. Special K, and I'm out.